Anyone want to bake a cake? I like to think about protein making as cake making. And it's a great way to understand some of the fundamental principles of molecular biology. I'm talking things like transcription and translation, mRNA. What do all these terms mean? Well, I wanted to make a little video um, to introduce people to these terms. Now, something I can refer people to. Um, so, hope this analogy helps you. And I'm going to give a brief overview, um, just a few minutes, and then I will dive into more detail. Um, and I'll ha with some slides that I have um, had prepared for something before. So the graphics aren't the best and everything, but um, hopefully I can help walk you through some of the topics. Here's a quick overview of the fundamentals of molecular biology. Proteins are like the workers of your cells. They're the things that do everything from piece together DNA letters to hold together the walls of cells. The instructions for making these proteins are called genes. And they're stored as, um, they're stored in the nucleus, which is a membrane bound compartment inside of cells. These genes are stretches of DNA. RNA copies of these recipes are taken out into the general cellular exterior, interior, the cytoplasm, in order to make proteins from them. You can't check out the cookbook because you want to protect those original recipes. So instead, cells first make an RNA copy of the gene in a process called transcription. This is then taken out of the nucleus into the cytoplasm, where protein-making complexes called ribosomes turn it into a protein. But before you can export that, um, that RNA out of the nucleus, you have to make some edits. So basically, when you, if you make a direct copy, a letter-to-letter -letter copy of the DNA into RNA, that gives you pre-messenger RNA, pre-mRNA. Before it gets taken out, it goes through some editing. So the regulatory regions called introns get removed in a process called splicing, and then a cap and a kill get added, which will serve as sort of binding sites for important um, factors in the cytoplasm as well as protecting the ends of the RNA from exonucleases, which are RNA chewers that'll attack the ends. Um, at this point, the protein can get um, made in a process called translation. So we call transcription is when you go from the DNA gene to the RNA messenger RNA. Both of those are written in the language of nucleic acids. Um, so DNA and RNA are both nucleic acids. Um, so we call that process transcription because we're making a copy, but we're not changing languages. When we go from the mRNA to the protein, however, we are changing from out of the nucleotide, um, nucleic acid language and into the protein language. So proteins are written in um, letters called amino acids and three, a series of three mRNA letters, which we call a codon, spells for one amino acid letter. So this allows you to translate between, this tells the ribosomes what to add. Um, and when it does this, so it's translating out of the nucleic acid language and into the amino acid language. The amino acids have different properties, um, such as charge, size, Etc. And so this causes the protein to fold up into the optimal shape for that sequence of amino acids, which allows different proteins to take on different shapes that have important functions. And all of this is taking place in the cytoplasm, where, and the DNA gene is still locked up tightly in the nucleus where it's safe. How do you go from a gene to a protein? I like to think of it a bit like baking a cake. Um, so this is an analogy that I use a lot, and um, these terminology that I'm going to be discussing is really fundamental to all of molecular biology. Um, so I wanted to give this 
short video as a sort of reference that I could point people to when I want to talk about further details of some of the things that I'm discussing. So the recipes for proteins are written in genes. Um, gene and um, in eukaryotes like us, so basically eukaryotes, we have like membrane bound compartments in our cells. So almost everything except for bacteria. Um, and so our, so our genes are housed in um, a membrane bound room in the cell called the nucleus. Um, different, so different genes are like recipes for different proteins. So you can think of it as like a cookie or a cake, except in our cells, these are things like a DNA polymerase, which puts together DNA letters, or actin, which is a structural protein that helps um, keep things together in your cell and move things around. These recipes are combined into cookbooks called chromosomes. And we have 30, 23 pairs of chromosomes. And the whole collection of your cookbooks is called your genome. So what are actually these chromosomes? Because they're not really books. But um, what they are is each chromosome is a long um, double-stranded DNA um, coiled up tightly. Um, and it does this, you need to coil it up because there's so much DNA it would never fit inside of your cells if you didn't. So it wraps around these proteins called histones um, to get really, really coiled up. But within the, um, if you look in closer, you see you have this like the classical double helix uh, DNA structure. And it's made up of these two strands, anti-parallel, so they're running in different directions. Um, of uh, DNA letters, um, nucleotides, or actually deoxynucleotides. Um, so DNA stands for deoxyribonucleic acid. And it has generic parts that allow it to link up um, so it ha to other DNA letters. So it has these phosphate groups and this um, at the five prime end, this three prime, um, hydroxyl group, and then, um, so those allow them to link together to form chains. They also have a unique part. So there are four DNA letters, and they each have a unique nitrogenous base. Um, so A, C, G, or T, and this allows them to pair between chains. So this is specific. Um, specific. So you get A to T and G to C. And this is called base pairing. And it allows one strand to be used as a template for making the other strands. So all of this is housed in the nucleus. Problem is, the protein makers, the ribosomes, are in the cytoplasm, which is basically the general cellular interior, so outside of the nucleus. So we need to get the recipe to them. And the nucleus is like a reference section of the library. You can't check recipes out, but you can make copies. So if you think about it, you really want to protect those original recipes. So it wouldn't make sense to have the protein maker is always trying to nag it and make protein directly from it. But if you make a copy of it and then you export that out of the nucleus into the cytoplasm, now you can keep your original copies protected in the nucleus. And another, there's a, some other added benefits of making these copies because you can um, make lots of copies. So instead of just having that one original, there are lots and lots of these ribosome sh chefs out in the cytoplasm. And so if you give them lots of copies, then they can work on all of those copies at the same time, which is especially important because you have to compete for all the other protein recipes that need to get made. So cells can regulate the levels of various proteins by regulating the number of copies that they make. 
So in order to make a protein, a cell first makes a copy, and it makes this copy in RNA instead of DNA. And so RNA and DNA are both very similar. They're both written in nucleic acid alphabet. Um, so they have that same general phosphate sugar base um, layout, but RNA has an extra oxygen in it, sugar. So it's ribonucleic acid instead of deoxyribonucleic acid. And RNA has a U instead of a T, but it can still base pair with A. So just as one DNA strand could act as a template for another DNA strand, um, a DNA strand gene can act as a template for making the mRNA for making the RNA copy. Speaking of which, in order so in order to make a protein, our cell first needs to make a messenger RNA copy of its gene or mRNA. So you have your gene that's written in DNA letters. And well, well first it's going to make a pre-mRNA. And it needs to be edited before it can leave the nucleus. So this process of making the RNA copy is called transcription. And um, then it undergoes editing um, to get mature mRNA. And since we're going between, the reason we call it transcription is because we're, DNA and RNA are both written in the same nucleic acid language. So we're not changing languages, we're just um, making a copy. Um, so after you make that original pre-mRNA, however, it needs to go through some editing. So DNA and the pre-mRNA have exons and introns. So exons have the protein making instructions. Um, and different in exons have instructions for different parts. And then these exons are separated by regions called introns. These don't have the protein making instructions, but they have sort of regulatory notes that are important for um, in the nucleus, such as controlling when cell, when um, transcription occurs and that sort of thing. So they have to have like binding sites for various proteins that help regulate um, the processes. So these introns get removed in a process called RNA splicing um, to make mature mRNA. So your pre-mRNA has the exons and the introns, and the mature mRNA only has the exons. But it might not have all of them. Um, so and we can also make a DNA version of this mature mRNA to get an intronless version of the gene. Sorry, that should say intron instead of inton. Um, and we call that DNA version of the mRNA cDNA for complementary DNA. That's where we put in cells when we want to get them to make a protein um, for in recombinant protein expression. So if you don't remove all of the regulatory information when making pre-mRNA. Splicing leaves um, on the front and back matter. So three five prime UTR um, at one end and the three prime UTR um, at the other end. And so five prime refers to, remember, that's where the phosphate group is. And then the three prime is where that OH is. And so DNA is and RNA are both directional. Um, so you go from five prime to three prime. Um, and so that's what the five prime and the three prime here refer to. Yeah, so sorry, the prime um, symbol is just that little like apostrophe that always confused me. Um, and I was too afraid to ask, but that just means prime. And that just refers to the end. Um, so these, they're called untranslated regions because they're present in the mRNA so they've been transcribed, but they can't, they don't get translated. And so translated is when we make it into the protein. Um, so, so we call it translation because we're changing languages, as we'll see from the a nucleic acid language of RNA and DNA into the protein language of amino acids. So having these introns is more important than just having places for proteins to regulatory proteins to bind. It also allows for you to edit this mRNA in different ways um, to get different um, mature mRNAs and thus different proteins.
So this is called alternative splicing. And so it allows you to use the same gene to get um, to make a bunch of different types of protein. And what's really awesome is that you're not messing with the DNA. Um, so you're still the splicing is only affecting the RNA copy. Um, so the genomic version, this gDNA, um, stays the same. Um, the gDNA can get edited, however, in which case we call it a mutation. And it's not at all bad. A uh, mutation also can get a bad rap, but it's um, the form, how evolution occurs. So sometimes in the course of evolution, a whole gene gets duplicated. So you have two copies of that recipe in your cookbook. Um, evolution can then, through random mutations, play around with one of the copies while the other copy stays safe. Um, and so in what's a process called exon shuffling, um, genes mix and match exons. Um, and this occurs in the DNA version, so it's long lasting as opposed to the alternative splicing. So you can also have an individual exon get duplicated. Um, exons from multiple genes can combine to give you um, proteins with new functions. Um, of course, it doesn't always work out well, and that's where natural selection comes to the rescue. Um, in addition to that editing that is selective, um, and there's a sort of generic editing that occurs. So one of the benefits of having the um, mRNA processing is that it leaves behind um, messages, basically like there are proteins left over that give it, that tell the nuclear export people that the pro that the mRNA has been processed. And this is important because um, you don't want to let out unprocessed mRNA. So, and the processing is really important. In addition to the intron removal, there are, so basically you want to remove the introns because they're like gibberish to the protein makers. And so then they make you have a, like a gibberish protein, which wouldn't be good. But there's more processing that occurs to the mRNA as well to make it mature. And that's to protect it um, and to help um, provide binding sites for the ribosome and associated factors. So basically, the 5 prime end gets to this methyl G cap. So it's like a backwards G that's been methylated. So it has like a CH3 group added. Um, and then the 3 prime end gets this polyadenosine tail. So it's just like a long chain of the letter A. And that is important for serving as um, a binding site for various factors. And the other important thing about having this cap and tail is that it protects the ends of the RNA. So inside of your cells, you have proteins called um, ribonucleases. And so what they'll do is they'll just like chew up raw and like exposed ends of RNA, which is really good for if there's like viral RNA and stuff in your cells, but you don't want it to chew up your mRNA. Um, so the cap and the tail help with that. So at this point, we have our mature mRNA, and then it's taken out into the cytoplasm um, where our chefs are waiting to follow the instructions, adding the, um, the ingredients to make the protein in a process we call translation. Um, we call it this because we're going from the mRNA, which is in RNA letters, to protein, which is in amino acid letters. Um, and since that's a different language, then we call it translation. Um, so we had those four DNA letters, four RNA letters, and we have 20 common amino acids. Um, Similarly to our nucleotides, they have a generic part and a unique part. Um, so the generic backbone allows them to link into chains. And the unique um, part, the side chain or R group, um, which has different properties. And so the properties cause the proteins to fold differently um, based on the properties, like some are small, so they can move around. Some are really big and bulky, so they restrict the motion. Some are charged negatively, some are positively. Um, so based on their unique needs, the protein will fold up in a way that best accommodates all of them. And that's how you get a cool um, 3D protein.
So, but how do you get, how does the ribosomes know what order to add things when? Um, so basically the, the ribosomes is a complex that's made up of proteins and RNA. And it travels along the mRNA, reading the instructions and having um, their servants, which are the transfer RNAs or tRNAs, bring them the matching ingredients, so the amino acids. So tRNAs provide a link between the two languages. So you have three nucleotide codons. Um, so basically mRNA words corresponding to one amino acid. Each amino acid has at least one of these codons, and you can find them in a dictionary called a codon table. So the mRNA has a codon, the tRNA has a matching anticodon, and it carries the corresponding amino acid. These, um, letter, these letter words are like not overlapping, so as long as you know where to start, then you read in three letter steps, um, and the tRNA will bring it. So a really cool thing about this is that this genetic code is universal. So no matter humans, bacteria, yeast, uh, mouse, you name it, we all read the same language. And so if we want to study a protein, we can use a process called molecular cloning to stick a copy of its recipe um, into a circular piece of DNA called a plasmid. And this acts as a little extra cookbook we can stick into bacterial cells. Um, so we take this, um, the cDNA, we put it into this plasmid, and then we stick it into um, cells to have them make the protein for us. And we call this recombinant protein expression because we've recombined cookbooks. We put our gene into that plasmid. Um, but the cells also have a lot of other recipes of their own and make lots of proteins. Um, and so as a protein biochemist, my goal is to separate the one I want from all the others so I can play with them and figure out how they work. Um, yeah, no tasting in the lab. So instead, I take advantage of some other types of differences like charge, size, and, um, et cetera, to purify the proteins using chromatography, which um, uses like little beads with um, various properties that you separate proteins by flowing them through. And I have um, a lot more chromatography in other posts. Um, so basically to review, DNA is stored in the nucleus and RNA copies are taken into the cytoplasm to make proteins. The recipes for proteins are in the nucleus in the form of genes, which are stretches of DNA and they're housed in chromosome cookbooks. You can't take out the cookbook. So if you want to make a protein, you first need to make an RNA copy of this that you take into the cytoplasm, where the chefs, our ribosomes, turn it into protein. That process is called transcription, and it leaves you with pre-mRNA, which is still in the nucleus. Before you take it out, you need to edit it. So it gets a, um, the introns get removed, the regulatory, those are the regulatory regions. You also get a five prime um, methyl G cap and a three prime polyadenylene tail. These will provide landing pads for various um, cytoplasmic factors and it also protects the ends of the RNA. Now this is taken out into the cytoplasm where you can make your protein in the process called translation. In translation, the ribosome moves along the, RNA, the mRNA, and tRNAs bring the matching, bring amino acids corresponding to the um, codons present in the mRNA. At the end of the process, you have your protein, and now that protein can go to work. You still have that mRNA, and you still have a bunch of ribosomes, so more and more protein can get made from it. Ribosomes, usually you have multiple ribosomes translating the same RNA at once, so you can make lots of copies at once, and then cells can regulate how much um, the degradation of the mRNA. And so one way that they can do this is with the process called um, microRNA-mediated regulation, where little um, short RNAs called microRNAs bind to um, binding sites in that three prime UTR 
and directed segregation. And that's one way that I, that's the way that I study, um, but that's a special way. And there are also just general um, mRNA decay mechanisms. But um, I hope that helped explain things and happy learning.